Amen. We're going to continue to worship this morning through the reading and preaching and hearing of God's Word. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1 as we finish up this first chapter of Mark's Gospel together. It's good to be back with you. We missed you being away. It's good to get some rest and relaxation. I want to thank Jason and staff for all that they have done to continue with ministry while we were gone. Most recently, we were at General Assembly, which if you're not familiar with the Presbyterian Church in America, our denomination, um, that's our highest court. It's a once a year gathering that is in various places each June. Um, this past week we were in Richmond, Virginia, and we do the work of the church. We um, get reports, we discuss changes, we disagree friendly, uh, in a friendly manner uh, on the floor as we wrestle through things that we believe um, are the way they should be or maybe should be changed in our book of church order. Um, but all of that was... Um, conducted this past week. It was a great time together with uh, the, the church. It was a blessing. There was worship each evening, um, and, and there was no major disagreement, and there was a great unity among uh, the brothers there. So um, I hope to give a greater and fuller report at a later date, but I just want you to know several of you have asked me as I came in this morning. Um, it was a really good week, and I am ever thankful for the PCA. I, I love our denomination, um, and I love uh, the things that we love, and, uh, and I'm thankful we're in a healthy place. Um, as a big C church uh, in our denomination, of course, there are other denominations that are faithful to the word as well, um, but we love our denomination, and we're thankful for it. Um, we are, just one more note, and, and I'll say more about this, like I said later, but in, in, a, in a season, in a, I'll say a decade of rapid decline in the church as a whole uh, across our nation, um, and there is drastic decline in the church in America, um, the PCA is maybe even the only denomination that has grown and that has gained strength and numbers and finances in the last decade. We have a lot to be thankful for, um, for how God is blessing our church and our uh, group of churches. There's 88 presbyteries. There are thousands of PCA churches across the country. And, um, and so we're thankful for that growth. We want to see that growth continue. Um, and so I uh, just want you to know that we're a part of something much larger than what you see here. Um, and we are a large church as far as PCA um, standards or uh, averages go. Um, and, and we are a part of something much larger than, than this. And I'm thankful to be a part of a faithful, um, scripturally based, um, passionate uh, denomination. So with that brief uh, excerpt, let's look to the reason uh, why we have our Bibles open in front of us. Mark chapter 1. Before I read, I want to pray. Please bow with me. God in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that you use it in our lives. We open it now expectantly, recognizing our need for you to come by your spirit and illumine our minds, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. We pray for those who aren't able to be here with us today because of life circumstances, trials, recovery, sickness, injury, bereavement. Lord, you know their situation. We pray that you would be with them where they are. We want to pray this morning for our governor and for our state congressmen and women, for those who lead us as South Carolinians. Lord, would you bless them? And would you continue to put Christians in those halls of justice? Would you make our state a state that loves your church, that loves your son? Would you exalt Jesus Christ throughout 
South Carolina and in the churches of this town. We pray for the word being preached even now, O oh God, that you would anoint it by the power of your spirit, that you would use it for effectual growth in the lives of those who believe. We thank you for faithful men who expound your word to your people. We pray that you would protect those pulpits. May they, go, may they gain strength and grow in number. And may we continue to see healthy churches planted in our denomination. We thank you for the PCA. We pray your blessings on the 88 presbyteries that make up our denomination. We pray your blessings on Palmetto Presbytery here, the one that we're a part of. We pray for the other three presbyteries in South Carolina. Would you bless those churches, those pastors, those elders and deacons? Would you protect the ministry that's happening there? And would you exalt Christ in their midst? We pray for our first responders here in Chapin, in our community, for our police, our firefighters, our EMS. Lord, would you bless them and protect them and give them strength? They see on a regular basis what we can only imagine, what we wince at in thought, what we turn the channel from on the television. Lord, would you help them? Would you bless them? Would you build up the witness of Christ in their midst, placing Christians in those vocations to be lights in dark places? Would you help them to perform their duties for the care of this community to the best of their ability? Would you gift them and strengthen those gifts? Would you do that for your glory? Lord, we, we know that Healthy first responders are a part of a healthy community. And a healthy community is built and centered around the family unit that loves you and follows you in faith. So would you do that here in this place? Would you raise up fathers that would lead their families in worship, that would lead their families in church community, that would lead their families in their vocation, whatever it is, as first responders or otherwise? Would you help our men see the beauty of their calling in their work. That though often it seems like toil, thorns and thistles, frustration, it is what you have called them to, what you've called us to. And though it isn't easy, you have ordained these means for our good, for the provision and protection of our families. We pray that we would have a community of men who work hard, work long hours to protect and provide. May we follow your example in doing so. So as we come now to your word, Lord, would you focus our minds, use it for your glory and our good, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 35, this is the word of the Lord. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news 
so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The Messianic Secret, that's the title of uh, the sermon that we'll look at together this morning. The Messianic Secret is something that scholars use to describe what we read just now in verse 40, 43. Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. And, and what he said was, don't tell anybody. This seems to be a theme of Mark that we'll see in the weeks and months ahead. But Jesus was planning and preserving his time as a known entity. And scholars think that he was trying to orchestrate through doing good works, but not through witness being given to those good works by those he did them to. He was trying to control his popularity. As we can see here, it didn't work. It's kind of odd, isn't it, if you think about it? And Jesus gives us the charge now in our age and time to go and tell, and we don't. Then he was telling the healed to not tell, and he did. This is a paradox of Jesus' commands. But this messianic secret, it really is a double meaning, because I don't want to talk too much about what Jesus was doing and how he was orchestrating geographically planning his route and all those kinds of things that most likely he was when he was trying to keep the lid on what he was doing for people. Think how hard it would be if God did what you'd always wanted him to do and then he told you not to tell anybody about it. He did this to, he did this to Paul and Paul's discipleship process. He was carried up to the third heaven and he was ordered not to say anything about it. Can you imagine going to heaven and not being able to tell anybody? So he kind of did, kind of like indirectly. If you're a student of the New Testament, you know what I'm talking about. But the point here is not just that there was some kind of gag order given here in these verses by Jesus, but there's also something here that makes up the bulk of the text that I don't think we can miss because it's so basic. It's almost something that that we glaze over, we forget about. It's almost something that is so quiet, it feels like a secret. It feels like, is that, is that really it? Is that all there is to it? It's that, it's that simple? It's that basic? It's in three parts. It's Jesus' prayer, it's Jesus' preaching, And it's Jesus' care. So first, look back at verse 35. Jesus rises very early in the morning while it was still dark, and he departed and went to a desolate place. Now, what made this place desolate? We don't know. Maybe it was just that there was nobody there. Maybe it was a place that nobody frequented because it was dry and there wasn't much to look at. So there wouldn't be any distraction. All we know is it's described as desolate. But we know when and how he went there. He went there in secret. He went there early in the morning before the sun ever even came up. Most of us are asleep by then. The really pious among us measure our devotion to Christianity by these kinds of questions. Well, what time do you wake up in the morning? You usually, most of us, don't wake up as early as Jesus did here. And really, the aim is not to, not to try to get up earlier than our neighbor, not to spend more time while it's still dark doing our private or our attention to pri- the private means of grace. The, the point I want you to see is that Jesus needed, he needed this. And he, he made time for it. There's, there's nine times, and this is one of the nine, in the Gospels where we see Jesus doing this kind of retreat into the darkness, away from everybody. Praying. What 
was Jesus praying? It's hard to know. I mean, he could have been thanking the Father for the ministry that he had already seen previously. He could be preparing. He could be praying for for the leper that he's going to meet in these subsequent verses. But in the nine times that we see him doing this kind of thing, he is doing it on purpose. In other words, we don't know that it was Jesus' habit every single day to disappear early in the morning, but we do know that when he needed to, he did it. Whether it was in preparation for something coming up, like the Sermon on the Mount, or meeting the enemy in the wilderness, or whether he was just exhausted. And so, again, the paradox of Christ is to fill his tank, he'd get up earlier than he normally would in the dark and go and pray. We don't think that that's actually what helps us, but it does. We don't think that there's energy there, but there is. Jesus focused his ministry on people. And in order to do so, sometimes, and, and all of the introverts in the room were like, yeah, <laughs> amen to this. He had to get away from people to do it. No distractions, just quiet, stillness, him and the Father praying. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you made a purpose to get up early or stay up late when the sun wasn't up just to pray? Just to pray without your phone, without the television, without anything else going on, but just you and the Lord in prayer. When's the last time? And, and obviously, I don't want you to shout it out. I want you to think about that. Lodge it away. Log it. And then repeat it this week. Or, or here's another question. What are you praying for? What's going on in the circumstances of your life that force you into desolate places for prayer. If, if you feel that, if that press is a reality in your life, know that you're not alone. If Jesus experienced it, we will too. We are his followers. He's our Lord. If he needed it, we will too. And so what, what things are you praying for when you do get away? What will you pray for this week? What, what's the one thing that you know, I, you know, this is something that keeps burdening my mind and the only thing I haven't done yet is pray about it. I've called and talked to people about it. I've had coffee over it, but I haven't committed it to prayer. I haven't wrestled on my knees, on my face, whatever is your habit, I haven't done that with this in prayer. This is, this is the secret. The means of grace. I mean, after all, we do believe that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is in the heavenly places. Against forces that we can't see. Paul teaches us that in Ephesians 6. Like, what we need, we can't access any other way except prayer. So why are we so prayerless? One of the things we, when we brought Jason on last year around this time, give or take a month or two, he's like, he's like what do, where are we weak? I said, prayer. We, we don't pray enough corporately. So one of the first things he instituted was corporate prayer times. We got one coming up in July, July the 14th. And you know what? Here's the sad part. Here's sneak peek. Most of y'all won't be there. You won't. Because you and I struggle to believe that we need to pray. So what we've done in July is we've added in some music so that maybe you'll come and hear music and pray. It's easier for us to see numbers on a page and give than it is to not know the battle that's being waged and come and pray. 
because we can't measure that. We can't know that those prayers are actually making a difference. And yet we see, modeled throughout Scripture, in none other than the Lord himself, prayer. His ministry was built on this foundation. His ministry is still built on this foundation. Jesus' prayer, that's the first secret. The second one is his, his purpose. Look back with me at the text. Peter comes to him. Everybody's looking for you. And there's a rebuke here if you, if you missed it. Like, like, what are you doing? Don't you, why are you hiding? Everybody needs you. The, your gig is up. We know that you're the only one who can do what you can do. And what does he say? Let's leave here. We're not going to stay here. Everybody here that's looking for me is going to get some bad news. I'm not staying here. Let us go on to the next towns. Why? That I may preach there also. We've talked about this. We talked about this previously in in this very gospel. Jesus' mission, his ministry, it began with preaching. It continues with preaching. Why do we sit on the Lord's day and listen to sermons? Because there's power in preaching that exists nowhere else. One of the things I love about the Reformed faith is the centrality of preaching in corporate worship. It's one of the reasons why we have this here in the front. And the other things that we do are on the side or down in the floor or over here or back there. You know why? Because this is primary preaching. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. But we sit listening to sermons and looking at our watches and we measure how long the sermon lasts and we wonder when it's going to be over because our heart is not tuned to the means of grace that God uses to give faith to his people. Our finger, and this is going to resonate more with the more experienced in the room this morning, our finger should be tuned to the dial of God's means of grace like our fingers used to be tuned to the radio looking for that frequency where we can actually hear what's being broadcasted instead of just white noise. And then we, and then we get it and we got really good at finding where it was that that knob needed to be turned so that we could hear the radio broadcast. That should be how we treat our preaching. Like I know there's one place where I can come and hear God speak to me in a way that he doesn't anywhere else in all the world and we need to get there and be there and commit to that. I mean, you remember how quickly you could find those stations? You millennials have no idea what I'm talking about. (laughs) Not to mention the rest of the Gen Z, Y, whatever else there is that's come after you. This, This is the primacy of preaching. And, and, and preachers haven't done their job either. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's not just about you who fall asleep or look at your watches. It's about us too. We, we make it about me. We make it about our name and our voice. And, and just this past week, two more mega church pastors have fallen in sin. Because that's what happens when you exalt men. Eventually you see, oh, wait a minute. They're just men. And we write books and we teach and preach at conferences like there's something special about us. Calvin said that when the word is preached on the Lord's day, it's like Christ himself. It is Christ himself who shepherds his flock. It's not a, it's not a man. It's not men. Why do we run after men in the singular? 
because we either forget or we've never heard this secret. It's Christ who preaches. It's him who applies his word to our hearts in such a specific and unique way that you can't deny it's him doing it. And he's doing it directly to you. And he's doing it in such a way that only you know it's happening. And you sometimes can't even explain it to anybody else. And sometimes you can and you don't want to. Because it's him. And he is laying you bare in such a way that you, you'd never want anybody to know that that's actually happening. Until you realize he's doing it to everybody here. And nobody knows what you're wrestling with or struggling through except for him. And he is coming with his blood to wash you up again, to put your feet upon the rock again, and to set the path clear and straight before you again. That's what he does through his word preached. That's why we come. That's the ministry that we see Jesus being about. That's why he came. And it's not just about preaching. It's about preaching the gospel. Like You need to know how much you need to know. And I didn't say that wrong. You need to know how much you need to know Jesus Christ. You need to be broken down again. You know, people who like progress, they like to be able to see the work of their hands, you know, cut the grass and, and sip the drink on the porch while they smell the freshly cut grass and see the lines. Struggle with the Christian walk because sometimes it's hard to see that progress. Sometimes it's hard to know that I'm actually advancing in this movement of discipleship where I'm dying to myself and becoming more like Christ. And because it's hard to see, we, we grow weary, we lose heart. And that's why you need to be broken down again to see, you know what, this is how it is for every one of us. And the preaching of the gospel is not just for those who haven't heard it. Preaching the gospel, the gospel that saves you, is the same gospel that sanctifies you. And you, you, hear, you hear the old, old story again. You're like, well, you know, some of us write this off. Like, I've, I've been here before, Scott. I know, I know this story. But the most mature among us love to hear the story. Love to remember how Jesus has done what he has done in our lives and how we need him to keep doing it. Oh, Lord, may we never graduate from the gospel. May we never leave this place of need and humility where we run to the word. So how do you hear it? I mean, what we just read in Question 90, how is the word to be read and heard that it may become effectual to salvation? The divines say it this way, pay attention to it with diligence. Some of you, that means you've got pen in hand or pencil and, and you're jotting down notes. That's fantastic. Good for you. Don't look down on those who don't. Some of you just need to focus. You need to see and hear and that's good enough. The divines go, oh, and you need preparation too, by the way. And I think, if you want me to expand a little bit on what the divines are saying here, preparation to hear the word preached, eight hours of sleep. Let me help you with some math. So you need to go to bed at 10 o'clock and get up at six-ish. Oh, I don't usually get up that early. Okay, go to bed at 11, get up at seven. But if you go to bed any later than that and you start getting up any later than that, then it, it makes it a struggle to get here on time. Because when you wake up, you, you probably need a drink of coffee or water or hot tea or whatever it is you like. You probably need some breakfast. You probably need a shower. You probably need to make yourself presentable. And then you need to get here. But you need to get here with a mindset on why you've come. It's to hear God do what God does in corporate worship. 
He does it through prayer, preaching, and the sacraments. There, there's nothing else of importance happening here. You don't have anybody else you need to grab that's more important than what's happening here in these means of grace after the service. Nobody you need to have a conversation with before you get here. You don't need to shake hands with anybody in the seats, in the rows. None of that is more important than these things. None of those things are bad. They're only bad when you misprioritize them. When you think that's why I've come. Prayer, preaching, and care. Jesus was the master at all three. Verse 40, a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. All right, there's nothing here that we can do to... to emulate Christ other than care for the needs that are those that are in those around us just like what you heard our mercy team attempting to do care for the needs of those around us first in our own body in the household of faith and then outside so in that way we can be like Jesus in these few verses but really we need to be more like the leper and I don't mean you need to go out and figure out a way to get some flesh-eating disease, but I do think you need to look at the circumstances of your life and figure out how God is using them to get you into this mindset. The leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling in front of him. You see that? He sought Jesus out because he knew Jesus was his only hope. He cried out to him, because he knew that he needed to confess with his mouth what he believed about Jesus. And he kneeled before him, exalting Jesus as the one worthy of worship, the one, the only one worthy of worship. Now, when we treat Jesus like that, then we start to get somewhere in our discipleship and not before. When we treat Jesus like he is the last drop of water on earth and we've run 25 miles and we haven't seen anything else that we can drink, when we treat Jesus like that, then God starts to move in our life. And not before. And so part of this preaching of the gospel is God, by his spirit, through his word, getting us to a place where we recognize that the thing that we've been dodging and hiding from and running away from is the very thing we have to come face to face with and carry to the cross and implore Jesus. And the good news is Jesus cares about that. Jesus, that's his will. That's what he says, I will. I want you to be clean. I want you to be healed. I don't want you to be a slave to this sin anymore. I don't want you to fight. I don't want you to be frustrated. I don't want you to have this problem in your life. That's why I came. Because whatever it is that we're dealing with, that you're dealing with, you're dealing with it as a result of sin, either yours or somebody else's. And Jesus came to remove the power of sin in the lives of his believers. So so you've got to get to the place where you believe that he can, that he wants to, and that he will when you ask him. And that's faith. That's you seeing it, you hearing it, and you saying, that's what I want. Jesus is the only hope. He's the only one who can do that. Please come do it for me now. Jesus prays, he preaches, he cares. It shouldn't be a secret. It's pretty simple. It's really hard to see it worked out in our lives. Let's pray together like the leper prayed. God in heaven, we thank you that you show us ourselves through your word. 
We thank you that you reveal our need, that you point us to yourself as the one in the person and work of your son who can meet us where we are, take away whatever burden we're carrying, give us hope, set our feet upon solid footing. Oh, Lord, would you help us? I pray for those within the sound of my voice this morning who, who are struggling in some circumstance, some relationship, feel like they're in a tunnel, a dark cave. There's no way out. Lord, would you show them yourself in this passage that you do will for them to have their gazes lifted to heaven, their hope set on eternity and the joy of your salvation in their hearts. Would you do that for all of us? I pray for those who are within the sound of my voice this morning who've never come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ.